you all know, uh, how many of you read my book? So you, you know I'm pretty emotional, right? That was emotional. If you didn't feel, uh, can I come down here? All right. Frankie, that was, uh, thank you. Um, as you were talking, I go through uh, so many memories of us going back. Uh, Frank and I go back 30, what? five years, something like that, right? Yeah, you were a little kid. I wish, I, I actually wish we had that, I know. that video. I Josh, you, you blew it, yeah. man. You, <laughs> I mean, all the things you said about Josh, take it away, because that video, um, I know. Next year, we're gonna bring it back. Josh, bring the video back next year so Got you it. can see a little Italian kid from Brooklyn looks like. <laughs> Frank. He was running out on the field. He was introduced. You're like at Yankee Stadium. I said, Frank, relax. You're not, you're in a, you're in a ballpark in Brooklyn. <laughs> um, my, uh, I think life's great, you know? I really do. I think that uh, the opportunities that we have in life, uh, thank you, the opportunities that we have in life are uh, really terrific. Uh, the reason I'm at First Data is because of my relationship with Frank. Uh, I got no other reason to be here. Uh, I, I left Willis, as you know, uh, at the end of uh, uh, 2013, middle of 2013. And at the time, I was 70 years old. Um, now, most people at 70 years old um, are, are taking gardening lessons or some shit like that, right? <laughs> Um, but I, 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 I don't do that. Um, I don't know how to garden. And um, I get manicures, so they screw up my fingers. Um, I run into Frank, because we are friends for a long time. And um, I'm always asking myself, and I'm going to leave you with some messages, because um, I hope we have an opportunity to talk again, but I want you to listen to some things that uh, are important to take away um, because you got to know that I always talk about vision, you know, all the time. For those of you who heard me before, I talk about vision, but I'm going to use a different word today just to make you understand that vision has lots of different definitions. And for me, another definition of vision is what else? Okay, what else? You gotta ask yourself the question all the time, what else? Um, for me, at the end of uh, Willis and 70 years old, I said, what else? I'm not done, um, it's what else? And I ran into Frank um, and First Data, and for me, that was my answer you know, to what else? And I'm always asking myself every day, what else? There doesn't have to be a clear vision of a specific thing, all you got to do is to convince yourself that there's a what else. If there's no what else, then you, you arrived. And nobody's ever arrived, so there's got to be a what else. And he provided for me a, a what else. It wasn't the end, it wasn't the only what else, but it was a, another what else to get me engaged. And so I did, and, and when we got here, there was a lot of work to do. I mean, a lot of work to do. The stuff that you were talking about yesterday was like, you know, a, like a master's degree in, in this place. Um, when we got here, I can't believe if we had opened up the room for questions, it would have been, I mean, you were talking about snaps and boarding tools and all that stuff. I mean, the damn snap didn't work. It didn't snap. It didn't... <laughs> Now they're talking about it working right. It didn't even work. I didn't even know what the hell it was. Somebody came up to me and said, the snap doesn't work. What snap? What are we talking about? <laughs> we're talking about a toy? What are we talking about here? We were in debt. We were out of money. We had nothing. We had nothing. So when you want to ask what else, you got a company with $24 billion of debt. $24 billion of debt. That's what they handed us, 24 billion of debt. 
And we raised three and a half billion dollars, then raised two point six billion dollars, then refinanced the stock, and now there's cash flow, and now we're generating operating leverage is going to get better and better and better. And you're surrounded by a bunch of people who are absolutely committed to what they do because they said, what else? What else? So when you got a room full of people here that I've been in business with the last couple of years, you, are, you understand that when I see people that are good after all these years, and I've been with the best of them, okay? I, been, I had dinner at Buckingham Palace only because they wanted to invite an Italian person. <laughs> Prince Charles said, go find an Italian person that runs a British company. It's in Plumeri. So I kept going there. All, so I know all these people. Okay? All these people here every day break their butt to be able to solve the problems so that we could do what else? And what else is to make this a great company? And what else is to make this a company that you're all proud of so that you can feel as the company's getting better, then you need to be getting better because the tools that you have and all the things that you need we're all part of that what else. And it's led by a fanatic. Frank is fanatic. I thought I was fanatic. He, he beats me in fanatic every day. He wins the fanatic award. I never had a conference call with my management team on Sunday night of Father's Day. That man's nuts. <laughs> Am I right? I said the truck, guy's nuts. I get it, it's Father's Day. Four o'clock in the afternoon, I mean, we're on this stuff. It's just that there's been a lot of stuff. You can't solve all this stuff. I don't know who was here before us, but they were in a coma. <laughs> so when, you, when you, you got all this stuff, you don't know what to solve first. So another stuff comes up, and it's Father's Day. I was intense. People thought I was crazy. He's nuts. Four o'clock in the afternoon, am I right? We get an email. We're going to have a conference call at 8.30. I said, doesn't, I said to myself, and I'm nuts. <laughs> it's Father's Day, Frank. <laughs> All these people are celebrating. Right, guys? Father's Day. We're going to drop what we're doing because he's so intense that we got stuff to solve and we don't have enough time to do it. So if you want to know whether you're in the hands of somebody that's at it 24 hours a day and is always asking, what else? What else can we do? Which is a reflection of what you got to ask. You're here now. Now you got to ask, what else? What else am I going to do? The man who's king of what else and who's an absolute fanatic to make this company great alongside great people that are sitting in the front row here. And I am blessed 70 years of being in business with the greatest business people in the world. I can reel off the names. I have, at 70 year old, I'm still asking what else. I meet a bunch of people that I never saw before knew some of them from a distance, knew some of them not at all, all because I showed up and I asked what else. I am privileged. I am privileged. This is not an advertisement. As Frank said, I don't need to have advertisements. I don't need that stuff. I don't make people feel good so they can do something for me. I don't need that. <laughs> so when I tell you, I'm telling you the truth. Frank and this management team are great at what they do, they are intense, they want to help you, they'll do everything you possibly can to make this company great, and I'm telling you, and I'm telling them, I am proud of the last couple of years or so, two and a half years that I've been in business with you, it has been my honor and pleasure, and you should be proud of them too. Give them a big round of applause. Next Father's Day, I'll be in Sicily, Frank. Mentors have to show up. <laughs> Mentors have to show up. 
I had, I want to talk to you about some stuff so you can remember this stuff, okay? Um, I think vision and what else are the same thing. You, you, I congratulate you, by the way. I forgot to do that. Congratulations. But I'm assuming that I'm congratulating you for what you have done. Not for what you're going to do, because you haven't done it yet. See, the whole point is to bask in what you've done and then ask what else. The great ones ask what else, right? You want me to tell you a story? You know, I got a lot of stories. You want to hear some stories? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, sir. So two weeks ago, it's a great story. I mean, I, I'm still at it. 72 years old, I'm still at it. I can't wait for the next day to happen. I don't know what's going to happen to me. You just got to go keep playing in traffic. So a guy says to me, Mike Pascucci, he says, you want to have dinner with Jack Nicholas? I think I want to do that. <laughs> By the way, does anybody know who Jack Nicholas is? Yeah. Huh? I just want to make sure. I don't want to keep mentioning names and then people say, well, who the hell is he talking about? You know, I'm acting like he, that's a good suit, man. <laughs> this is nice. Thank you, buddy. Nice to see you, pal. Nice to I mean, you're a man. You, look at this guy. This is a man who is the epitome of what else? <laughs> this is really what else, man. I, man, this guy, after he's done, he's going to baptize me. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. <Bill. laughs> you guys got self-esteem, man. <laughs> man. You got to keep going. So anyway, so I show up for dinner with Jack Nicholas. I mean, this is like, if you're a golfer, anybody you play golf? If you don't, you know, I mean, this is like the greatest golfer ever lived. So when I'm with people who are great, I ask them, how do you do that? Because you always want to get, you want to get better. So sometime between the appetizer and the main course, I said to him, Jack, was there ever a time where you felt like, excuse me, you wanted to get to the next level? Because people like that, you always think from a distance that they just at that level and they always stay at that level. That's what you think. Because you don't, you don't hear the other stuff, you don't see the other stuff. This is the greatest golfer that ever lived. He said in 19, from 1960 to 1978, he won 10 major tournaments. And every year, he won two events every year on the tour. He was considered the greatest golfer of his time. And in 1979, he didn't win a tournament, and he didn't win a major, and his golf game fell completely apart. I didn't know that. I just assume, you know, you're great forever. You don't do what normal people do. You run into problems. And he said, and, and I said, what did you do? He said, I called my teacher, whose name you don't know, but doesn't matter. You can look it up. His name was Jack Grout, G-R-O-U-T, was his teacher when he started playing the game. And he called his teacher. And he said, I want you to teach me the game again. I want you to teach me the game again. And Grout said, what do you mean? He said, I want you to teach me the game from scratch again. I lost it. So they went back to the driving range, and they started to teach him the grip, the stance, just like he had never played before. And it was the greatest golfer that ever lived. 
The next year, he won two majors. All because he asked, what else? I'm never good enough. It's never enough. You got to play in traffic. You got to stay in the game. And you got to ask yourself, how much better can I be? I'll do whatever I have to do to get better at what I do. And I got to tell you, if I think, Frank, about the last, I don't know, how many years of dinners I've had with great people, as much as I believe in always getting better and getting better and getting better, that one had to be the most memorable for me, for him to say he started all over again and he wasn't so brash and he wasn't so cocky to say, I'm the greatest in the world, man. I don't need, I don't need to go back to my teacher and figure out how to do this again. See, the, the real measure of definition of greatness is the fact that you've never arrived. Greatness means you never made it. Greatness means you keep asking yourself, what else? The people who think they've arrived are dead. That's what the greatness of this company is. We keep, we keep asking, what else? We keep asking, how much better can we get? And as long as we're talking to each other, we can do that. I mean, I've been playing so much in traffic in the, in the last couple of years, because I've been asking myself what else, frankly, of the 72 years of life, the last couple have been unbelievable. I mean, Guy Chirello, you just, you just saw Guy Chirello, okay? We are from the same town, Trenton, New Jersey. By the way, Trenton is not a metropolis. And there's, and, and there's a lot of Italians in Trenton, but I, I knew his family. I never knew the guy until I showed up here. And in the last couple of years, forged a relationship that I never knew I would have because I asked myself, what else? I left myself open to being able to do that, all right? Now, let me tell you what happens. Josh, what do you got up there? Get, get the Notre Dame thing up there. Put that up there. Josh is like a master at this. Now, don't make yourself look bad after Frank did all that. <laughs> OK. This is me. Last August, that's me. That's me. I'm, that's the Notre Dame football team. You know Notre Dame football team, OK? So let me tell you what happens. So I, I'm playing, I'm always asking what else. I'm always looking. I'm always trying to figure it out. So Guy says to me, I'm, I never do this. All charity golf tournaments, right, Frank, happen on Monday. Monday's the be worst day to have a damn golf tournament. Because Monday you want to start your work, you want to get after it. I never go to these things. Guy says, please come. Okay, I'll come, because it's Guy, because what else? Another relationship we forged, right? Live in the same town, all that stuff. So I go to the golf tournament, and what happens to me? He puts me in a cart with the head coach of Notre Dame, Brian Kelly. I mean, anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, so I'm with the Notre Dame coach. Now, what you don't know is that I didn't go to Notre Dame but one of my coaches in college was a former Notre Dame coach, Lou Holtz. So I'm in a car talking about Notre Dame and the fact that I got rejected. <laughs> I was rejected. I hate being rejected. So I'm having a great time with him for four and a half hours. This is why you got to go play in traffic. There's always got to be a vision. It doesn't have to be specific, but it's got to be what else? So at the end of the four and a half hours, we get to be pretty good friends. After the tournament, I, give it, I do this, right? He listens to this. And he said, you got to do this to my football team. I said, great. I mean, now I'm, I'm 72. And I'm doing this to 18-year-olds. <laughs> so he said, could you come at the end of two-a-days? That means two-a-day practices. It's hot. 
So I slept out there with a pink tie. <laughs> what else, man? <laughs> what else, man? <laughs> so I go out there with the pink tie, and I give this speech to the Notre Dame football team. I mean, these guys are big. And I'm doing my thing. When I finish doing my thing, I have no idea at the beginning of the year that last year that I'm going to do this. Unless I have a vision that stuff's going to happen as long as I ask, what else? So there I am, August 19th, 2015, Joe Plumeri, 72 years old, talking to the Notre Dame football team telling them they're going to win a national championship. After this is over, I speak to them for an hour, they mob me. I get mobbed. I thought I was going to get killed. <laughs> Guy was there, up in the top. They mauled me. These kids mauled me. They were so, a 72-year-old man. A guy taps me on the shoulder. This is cool. Guy taps me on the shoulder and he says, I need a release. I said, a release from what? <laughs> he said, we are doing a Showtime series on inside Notre Dame football. And we would want, we want to use the speech that you just gave, and you got to sign a release. So I said, this is cool. This is unbelievable. I don't know him. I go to a stinking golf tournament on Monday, only because of him, only because of what else? because of something new. I run into the coach, I wind up doing that, and then I wind up on Showtime. <laughs> Is that incredible? I mean, that's what I'm talking about with you. You gotta get up in the morning, and, and you gotta have a what else. It doesn't matter what it is, don't stand pat. Congratulate yourself, get the awards tonight, and then say, what else? Keep going. If I can keep doing it in 72, look at me. I'm nuts. <laughs> if anybody, this is true. Josh, put the other one up there. Whatever the hell you got up there. <laughs> this is a great story. This is a what else. The lady on my left is my wife. I, grad, I went to New York Law School. This is incredible. I went to New York Law School for three months and I quit. Some of you read my book, you know I went to get a job for what I thought was a law firm, it was a brokerage firm. I liked it so much that at the end of three months, I quit law school. 49 years ago, I quit. I get a letter from the law school last February telling me or asking me if, if I, would love to receive a Juris Doctorate degree, Juris Doctorate, it even sounds very nice, <laughs> Juris Doctorate degree <laughs> from New York Law School and give the commencement address at Carnegie Hall. You know Carnegie Hall? Practice, 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 that one. So I said to myself, isn't life great? What else? I quit this place 49 years ago, and they want to give me a degree. <laughs> it just goes to show you, man. What do I say? Anything's possible. So I go there. I go to Carnegie Hall. I give the commencement address, 1,900 people at Carnegie Hall. Could you imagine me at Carnegie Hall? Man, this is my cup of tea. I said to them, I feel like Sinatra, <laughs> Pavarotti, Carnegie Hall. They give me the degree. I do the commencement speech. And it's not over. It's, not, it's a what else again. And so they said, you know, it's been 49 years. So I said to everybody when I got up there, I said, I don't think in the history of education, anybody's ever been given a degree who quit. and quit 49 years ago. So they said, you know, it would really be nice if you came to visit the school. So I go to visit the school, 
and I find there's four or 5,000 square feet that they just built out. They don't know what to do with it. So I said to them, Josh, put that picture back up there. This is important. Frank was there. A lot of people were there. So I said to them, I got a great idea. Again, what else? You don't know what's going to happen as long as you got in your head. What else? So I said, if you, I got a great idea. If you make this space a place for the law students to practice law, you can have a law firm inside the law school. They said, that's unprecedented. And I said, I'll tell you what we'll do. Not only will the students learn the law and practice it, but they'll do it with people who can't afford legal advice. You'll do it for the underprivileged. You'll do it to a diverse community. You'll do it for people that have income inequality, racial inequality, veterans who are disabled, veterans who haven't gotten a fair break. All of the people in this society who need help and a break, which is what America is about and what the secret sauce of this country is about, we can do at the Plumeri Center for Social Justice and Economic Opportunity. That's what that is. That's, that's what that is, all because I said, what else? You see, it's what else? Josh, put up, what else is up there? This is incredible. One Sunday night, this Gabon, come here. They don't know what Gabon is. They don't know what a Gabon is. He's, oh, he's nuts. He's crazy. I love him. I learned from the best. <laughs> I love him. So I get, true story, I'm not making this up. I'm always getting texts. And by the way, they're not long texts. They're just short ones. And a lot of times they got to be decoded. <laughs> so I get a text, right? Cuba. It was four letters. It was four <laughs> letters. I said, so I write back, Cuba, exclamation, uh, a question mark. Cuba? Because that was the day that Obama you know, open relation, Cuba. So next I talked to him, I said, Frank, what are, you, what are you talking about? He says, we gotta be the first ones in Cuba. This is the way he thinks, okay? So this is a, a greatest example of what else? Who thinks the first time they hear it, a lot of people would say, hey, that's great. He said, that is great, why don't we get in there? Because they just accept cash, they don't accept Credit cards, they don't accept, it's not a digitized society. They don't have an ecosystem. So long story short, all because he sends me a text, says Cuba, Frank and I and Sam Latucci are taking it, that's a picture in uh, Old Havana, and the three of us taking a tour, meeting with the ministers so that First Data could be the one who digitizes and creates an ecosystem in Cuba so people can use credit cards so that that country can grow and enable commerce because of him. So I just, I, I, this I mean, is fun. See, this yeah. is what we do. So this is what else? Just to so understand like how we live life. <laughs> we get there on a Sunday night to Cuba, right? How many of you have been to Cuba? Right. So, you know, that's not a lot of you is the point, right? Not great infrastructure. Yeah. No. And, and people say Cuba, maybe you've heard this, Cuba's stuck in the 50s. You've heard that Cuba's stuck in the 50s. And, and Joe, you know, it doesn't take a lot to motivate Joe. Like one word. Cuba. And the next thing he's like, he's got it figured out. He's got ex-cabinet members. He's got the sauce stirring. He's, we're going to Cuba, Frankie. Good. We get there. And I'm like, okay, this place ain't stuck in the 50s. It's the 50s with 60 years of decay. Right? Just put that in perspective. And, uh, you know, we go have a dinner. It's a Sunday night, right? We go have dinner on Sunday night. We 
just go to bed, kind of lock ourselves in like this without clothes on. I'm not even joking. This is not, nothing we tell you, they're funny, but they're not jokes. Um, and, uh, and, and so Monday morning, the first meeting is at the National Bank of Cuba. Cuba is in charge of everything in Cuba. And uh, we're going to go see the, you know, fundamentally the treasury secretary of the country. We're all ready. We met in the morning. We figured our way around how to find the coffee. Um, and we go there. And we're in the meeting 10 minutes. We're giving them a Clover demo. We're giving them a Clover demo. We're giving them a Clover demo. <laughs> You're not giving them. We didn't bring 42 people. We're giving them a Clover demo. Right, Sam's carrying the case. Well, I'm talking the story. 15 minutes into the meeting, the lights go out. The lights go out. And for a moment, I've seen a lot of stuff. He's seen more stuff. For a moment, I think to myself, this really isn't that good. You know? <laughs> like, like... This is like the story, you know, American businessmen. Disappear in Cuba. <laughs> and they didn't, they didn't flinch. They didn't say a thing. Our clover was running on its battery. And that was the only light in the room. Right. And we're going through with the presentation. And finally, like 15 minutes later, the lights go back on. But I mean, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. And that was, you know, Monday morning. By Monday night, we're back in New York working again. You know, but Cuba, and, and baby. You gotta know, One word, Cuba. And you got to know that at the end of this month, we, uh, we, I met with the ambassador a couple times. After those sets of visits, um, we'll probably get an OK. We'll bring more people down to Cuba. Uh, but we'll probably get the OK. They don't have Wi-Fi and 3G every place. They got hotspots. And some of the hotspots are this big. We went into a place, right? It was Benetton, Frank. Yeah. And they had a terminal in there that goes back to Diners Club. Remember Diners Club? Yeah, it even said Diners Club on it. And, and, and so it doesn't accept credit cards. And, if you go to, if the, and, and so we're, we're, we're going to be the people, the company, that's the first one in there. We're not going to make any money for few years because it's going to take a long time. They call the embargo to blockade. Okay. But let me tell you something else. If you ever want to enjoy your freedom and you ever want to enjoy that you got the ability to ask what else, take a trip to Cuba, last for about three hours and come back and kiss the ground. Yeah. Kiss the ground. That's how great it is. And I got to tell you, when I went, we, we went, we stayed in the Hotel Nacional, and I asked the ambassador, the, the guy who was helping us, former Secretary of Commerce, Carlos Gutierrez, I said, Carlos, what's the, what's the Hotel Nacional like? Remember, Frank, he said, it's like the Waldorf. <laughs> so I expect the Waldorf. <laughs> Frankie and I check in. I got a room that's one up from Motel 6. <laughs> So I go to take, so, and, and, and it's a little room, two single beds. Got it? So I go to take a shower, and there's a handheld shower. But it wasn't meant to be handheld. <laughs> and there was a little ball. It was like, a, you know, like a, one of those little uh, ball bearings, show that was soap. So I'm trying to hold, there's no wash rag. So I'm trying to hold on to the ball with the handheld shower. And it's dropping. And I'm picking it up. And I'm doing this. It's really nice. And every time I try to go, you know, and it drops. Cuba. But we're going to be the first ones all because he asked what else. It's funny now, but when Cuba finally becomes what it should be, I got to tell you, I saw my 54 Merc. It was in Cuba. <laughs> if you are an old car freak, go to Cuba. It doesn't sound real good because it got washing machine parts, but who would have thought, all kidding aside, <laughs> 
Who would have thought that I and he would be in Cuba and digitize the economy and help those people be great again? Josh, what else? What else you got? No, that's not. Don't put that up there. That's later. Josh, you screwed up. Frank, take everything back that you said. That's not, that's not good either. Okay. So what I was trying to do is to give you, see this? This is my book. If you had told me that I was going to write a book at age 70, I told you you were nuts. I don't know how to write. I talk. I found somebody else who could write down what I said. But this goes to show you, and I never thought, I said, I'm going to do this. I am going to do this because it's an answer to what else, because I want to be able to share my thoughts with everybody. So a lot of you that read it, this is not a promo to book. This is just to tell you that if I tell you what else, I'm a living example of what else. That's what makes life exciting. It's not where you are. It's where you want to go next. And keep asking yourself what else. And it doesn't have to be a specific thing. It has to be just one thing. There's a chapter in there about my son that some of you read who passed away. I wrote about it, not in a sad way, but so it didn't happen to other people. There's been a club established of all the people who have children, who have drug addiction, who have problems, who now get together on a monthly basis and have a conference call, all because they read my book and they want to get closer to their children so the same thing doesn't happen to them. Is that cool? Is that, is that cool? <laughs> all because I'm asking what else? So you got to say vision and what else, or play and traffic is the same thing. You heard me talk about commitment, and you heard me talk about the Viking effect. Does everybody know what that is? The Vi Let me tell you what that is. Who knows what it is? A couple people. I'll tell you what it is, and I'll put it in context. When you make a commitment to do something, how many of you commit to be back here next year, grow your business 10%? Raise your hand. You're all, who, doesn't, who didn't raise their hand? I'm watching you. <laughs> you make a commitment. Now, is it one of those commitments? Is it one of those commitments that that's what I'm going to try to do, but if I fall short, it's going to be okay? Is it one of those commitments? It's, in other words, a lot of people, you know, make commitments. And they say, well, if I don't make it, there's always option A. Or if I don't make it, then I can always do that. There's that kind of commitment. We don't do that here. We make commitments. I call it the Viking effect. The Viking effect is, you know who the Vikings were? Let me start right off the bat. Who doesn't know who the Vikings are? It's not the Minnesota Vikings. <laughs> I'm a Packers fan. <laughs> I don't give a shit if you're a Packers fan. They crushed the Vikings. I'm time. talking about the Vikings. How are you, George? Great. Nice to see you, pal. You know, every time I see you, I really am excited that God gave me my hair. I really. <laughs> Give me a hug. <laughs> so let me tell you what the Vikings do. They were, they, were, like, they were conquerors from the north, which is now Scandinavia. They had those silly helmets with the horns, right? And as soon as they landed their boats, on a shore they were going to conquer, they got out of the boat, and what do you think they did? They burned the boat. They burned it. And you got to say, what are you, nuts? How could you get back? The burning of the boats meant to them that there was no turning back. They're all in. They're all in. That's commitment. You see, you're going to have adversity in the battle. You're going to have things that go wrong. Now, a lot of people, when they go wrong, what they do is run back to the boat, theoretically, whatever your boat is. But if you burned it, you got no choice but to make sure that that commitment, that commitment is proven to be right. You're going to run into a lot of stuff between now and this trip next year, and you're going to have a chance to say to yourself, nah, I tried hard, 8% is good enough. No, you made a commitment. 
You made a commitment to grow your business, whatever you want to grow it. You burned your boat. You can't run back to a boat that's not there. You burned it. That's what I told Notre Dame football team. I burned my own boat. So based upon, is everybody committed to burn their boat? Yes. Are you committed to burn your boat? Frank, watch, look at, stand up and look at them. They all, <laughs> did you, are you committed to burn your boat? Yeah. Things go wrong, you going to run back to the boat? No. Because you can't, why can't you run back to the freaking boat? There is no boat. <laughs> no boat. You remember that when you get one of those days, you say to me, Plumeri said, I got no boat. Right. <laughs> no place to run. That event that Frank was talking about, it wasn't an event. It was my wedding. Now get this, I'm, I'm crazy. I had all these executives at Willis that I ran, okay? And I, when I left Willis, I was going to do another gig, be another CEO of another company, grow it like it did Willis. But then I got enamored with First Data. I saw what great things we could do for the company, for the economy, helping people. I said, this is great. I think I'm going to stay here. This is great. So I wanted to bring over all the people that I was kind of leaving in reserve at Willis. So if you talk about burning the boat, so I get married on April 5th, 2014. Frank happens to sit at the table at my wedding. How shameless is this? I am recruiting at my wedding. You want to talk about commitment? Sits down at the table, Frank doesn't know any of these people, and obviously I got a contract that I'm not supposed to do this, but it's my wedding, and if they happen to sit at the same table, uh. <laughs> Josh sits at the, Josh is my head of communications, Adam Rossman, my general counsel, is my general counsel at Whittle, Willis, the, um, who, uh, Mike Naborik, who was the chief financial officer, all those people are here. And the reason they're here is because I wanted them to be here because I made a commitment, I burned my boat. Once I did that, I kind of said, I'm done with being my CEO of another company because I love it here and I want to help him and everybody else grow something great. So if that's not burning your boat, that you set up people at your own wedding. And by the way, during the wedding, after I do this and that, and I do the speech, I come on over to the table. I said, how are you guys doing? I, and he, he says to me, I can't believe you're recruiting at your own wedding. <laughs> is that burning your boat? Huh? The other thing I want to tell you is, we talk about purpose and genuine concern. Help, don't sell. I'm, I'm telling you what else, and I'll burn this in your head. Help, don't sell. All this stuff about enterprise selling is about helping. It's not selling. We should get rid of the selling part of enterprise. Okay, it's enterprise help. You help people, then you'll, you'll, you're, you're, you'll answer what else forever. You'll feel great about who you are and what you are. Let me talk about two, I got a million stories. Let me talk about one story about help. I'm a kid, it's 1972. I am at Carter Berlin and Weill. Well, it's, it's Kogan Berlin, Weill and Levitt. In 1972, I want you to get your head around this. In a brokerage account, in 1972, I don't know if anybody, I go back that far. When there's cash in the account in 72, Christine, it wasn't swept. The cash went to the company. To the house. It wasn't, even though it was the customer money, we kept the money. So if you have big cash sitting in an account without being, without being invested, the company, the brokerage firm, 
took the money and got interest on the money. That's how crazy the world was. Interest rates started to shoot up and the bank started to do special things like create certificates of deposit. So if Chris Foskett or Barry McCarthy walked into the bank and said, I have $10,000, you can negotiate a CD at a rate and in a number of days you wanted to have that CD. So you would walk in and say, I want 10% for 20 days or whatever the case may be. The more money you had, the more the rate they would give you for the le shortest amount of time or long, whatever you wanted. So everybody was taking their money out of the account from us and taking it to the bank. So I, I said, we got to stop that. So my boss at the time and our future boss, Sandy Weil, I tell him, I said, we got to stop this. I said, we have to create something so the money stays here. So I said to our general counsel, Malin Frankhauser, doesn't matter. I said, how about if we created a CD? Because I'm thinking about help, OK? How about if we created a CD so that every day people could put money into a CD and we took the total of that CD and let's suppose it's a million dollars and we bought a million dollar CD at let's say 10% interest and then we allocated it to all the people who contributed. So somebody who contributed $1,000 would get the same amount as somebody that contributed $50,000 because that's the way it worked. We bought one big one and then allocated the interest rate out depending upon how much you had. I thought it was a genius idea. I said to Sandy, I said, this is what we need to do. I'll go around the country, we'll create these things. And, and he says, well, that, we're not gonna get any interest. I said, but the money is taken out of the account. We're not gonna have it forever. You gotta help these people, help. So I went around the country, I asked Malin, is this okay to do? He says, it's okay. I go around the country, raise millions of dollars in this crazy scheme I got. He told me it was okay, that the SEC was not gonna bother me. I go to Miami Beach. There's a thousand people in the room. They're all over 90, <laughs> except one kid in the front row with a legal pad and a crew cut. And I noticed him because he stood out from the crowd. The next day, Malin calls me and says, we just got a cease and desist order from the SEC saying that what you're selling, what we're selling is a security and has to be registered. What do you think I did without knowing? Anybody have a money market fund? How many of you have a money market fund or ever had a money market fund? That was the beginning of a money market fund. A year later, the money market fund was created called the Reserve Fund. And what I had done without knowing was create the same vehicle like a money market fund, all because I was trying to help. And now how many trillions of dollars is in a money market fund? Help. Figure out a way to help. People will love you forever. Service is the same way. When I was at Citibank, I don't know if I ever told you this, Christine, but they had more metrics when I ran the branch, the branch, uh, branch of Citibank than you could imagine. And so one day I'm looking at a metrics, they called it a loyalty metrics. And what was interesting was, is that all the people who had a problem and we fixed the problem were more loyal than the people who never had a problem at all. I was flabbergasted at this statistic. If they had a problem and we immediately fixed it, they were more loyal to people that never had a problem at all. So I said, screw everybody's account up. <laughs> but obviously we didn't do that. But that's how important service was because you were able to fix it. You showed them a quick response. You showed you cared about them, right? right. Help, don't sell, help, don't sell. Tina, where are you? Tina, stand up. Tina, we were in Birmingham. Frank said yesterday, tell us your problem and we'll help you. In most companies, people want people like us to help them, 
but they won't. In this company, we got to beg people <laughs> to have them help, let us help you. So Tina, in just a couple of minutes, tell the story of the word help and what you cornered me frenetically. You were crazy in bat. No, don't, don't attack me. <laughs> but we're in Birmingham, right? I'm visiting the classrooms and everything. And, you, and the thing was over and I went outside. You said, wait, Joe, Joe, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I think Steve was doing that. I wasn't doing that. I, I was very cool. Oh, okay, so what happened? Quick, um, quick. Quick, okay, so we have a national account that needed clover, um, needed uh, special attention for clover to be great, as Frank and I were talking about, and um, I couldn't have done it without you, so I, I asked for your help. Well, she asked my help, and it was a long series of things that went a long way, right? But we got it done. So what was the outcome? Okay, of what we did and to help you, and we got it done. After a lot of people kept telling you, we can't do it, we can't do it, we can't do it. We got it done, and after one year of a lot of work, um, we, we actually won two large accounts and got the commitment that we wanted to from our state auditors. Okay, that's great. Give her a round of applause. We talked a lot about the Willis Tower. I'm just gonna leave you with a couple more things. We talked a lot about the Willis Tower and everybody says that was really great. But actually, I don't think I really sold. I think that was help. It was 2009, if you own a building and it's 60% occupied, mm -hmm. that means 40% of it's not giving you any income and the credit markets are closed and you can't get any money and then uh, somebody shows up and says, I want to help you. I don't know that I'm, I've been given too much credit for changing the name of the Sears Tower. I actually went in and helped the guy. I knew he had, no ca he had cash flow problems. 40% of a building without getting income, I don't care where you are, that's bad. And if you can't get money because the banks are closed because it's 2009, that's bad. So if I show up and tell you, I'll take some space and I'll help you because you got a new lease from a AAA tenant to the bank so you can get some money because you got a AAA tenant in there. That, that, I didn't sell anything. I simply helped the guy. So I get a lot of credit for selling, and I get, did a little bit, but I actually helped the guy because he was in a crisis and he had no choice. If you help people, you don't have to sell. You just need to help them. Help, don't sell. Help, don't sell. The business need analysis is about help, don't sell. Enterprise is about help, don't sell. That's how that tower happened. I helped the guy. He had no choice but to name the building what I wanted to name it. 60%, and the building was worth $500 million in 2009. $500 million. He just sold it for a billion three. You think I helped him? His name is Joe Moynihan. The place is totally occupied. It's the home of United Airlines, Continental United Airlines, largest airline in the world. It's 100% occupied, all because I showed up and helped them. I helped. I said, what else? Right? I, the what else was named the building Willis. That's the what else. Always ask yourself, what else? Help, and then what else? If I just stopped and got the two floors, no, I kept asking, what else can I do? Enterprise, what else can I help them with? What else, what else, what else? That's how you grow. You take the commitment to vision and you get the passion, you know, that we're talking about. That's the way it goes. It's the vision and what else? It's the commitment, it's the purpose, the genuine concern, it's the help that all leads, you know, to the, to the passion. Josh, put the, put the uh, slide up that you, were, you put up before. All of you are here. You know what that means? You're, ah, but a man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? Does anybody want to tell me what that means? I'll tell you what it means. You are here because you have reached your grasp. If I can grasp this high, that means it's within, I grasp it. It's within my grasp. Your reach should exceed your grasp. 
which means you got to go much higher than is easy. See, I got to really reach. So if you guys are going to grow your business, you all committed, Frank saw you, you all burned your boats, you can't do this this year because that's your grasp. Stand up, my man. <laughs> Wait a minute, I'll help you. <laughs> what is that? At your grasp, right? Now, if you want to do better than your grasp, because that's pretty easy, right? Yes, sir. That's all you did. At your grasp. You want to do your reach should exceed your grasp. What do you got to do? You got to stretch, man. Yes, sir. You got to, right? You got to move it up. You got to do something. Now, you need some help from the company. I'm helping you. <laughs> huh? Yes, sir. So you get on your toes, and now I'm going to help you. Ah! Now we're not 10% bullshit. We need 20, 30. You see, your reach. <laughs> Should exceed your grasp, or what's a heaven for? You got it? I'm having too much fun. I gotta keep it. put that, put Murph up there. I said I gotta show you this. So, if you get if you get wounded in Iraq or Iran or something, I don't know. I might I might get pissed off at the country for sending me there. It's a, you know, your attitude. So, I I was honored at Wounded Warriors, which is a foundation that raises money for wounded warriors. So the night before the gala, I spoke to the wounded warriors and their caregivers last May in New York City. See, this is what else. I didn't know this was going to happen. I just show up, man. I just play in traffic. Life's great. So I go talk to the wounded warrior. I tell them my stories. And then I say, I'm going to give you my book. And I, if you want me to sign the book, I'll sign it. I'm not thinking, guy, that anybody wants to me to sign my book. These people are blind, they're in wheelchairs, they got disabilities, they're gonna wait in line for me to sign a book? Are you crazy? So I sit at my table and there's a long line of wounded warriors. And not one of them, not one of them was upset at the country because they were wounded and sent them to war. As a matter of fact, their sense of patriotism got greater. They had dogs with American flags around them. Their wheelchairs were draped with American flags. And I'm sitting there, and then this guy shows up, and I'm emotional, as you guys know, and this guy shows up, he's blind, and that's his wife, Sharon. So he says to me, try to depict this, he says to me, my wife thinks, like this, my wife thinks you smell good. I said, thanks. He said, you don't understand. My wife thinks you smell good. I said, thanks. He said, but maybe you didn't hear me. My wife thinks you smell good. I said, okay, I'll give you some of the cologne. That's what he wanted. So he says, I want you to sign the book. He said, make it out to Murph with an F. He says, if you don't write Murph with an F, she's going to tell me. <laughs> I'm getting bullied <laughs> by this guy. So I said, Murph, I said, what was the day you became blind? He said to me, the day I became blind is the day I started to see. The day 
I became blind is the day I started to see. He said, I saw so many things so differently the day I became blind. If that's not passion, if that's not what else, if that's not help, you got a guy who can't see who's telling me he can see better than I can see. So you got to ask yourself, you're here. What a beginning. It's not an end. It's a beginning. Frank talked about the company, the stock. Let me tell you, gang, this room looks to be about 40, 45 years old. Okay? I used to be that. That was like 30 years ago, 32 years ago. In 1987, the Dow Jones was 1,600 and crashed. Then it weighed to 8,000 and crashed. Then it weighed to 17,000 points and had a little problem. And that happened over a 30-year period of time. When you're my age and 30 years from now, you're going to take the stock you have and I saw you when the analysts were talking and Glenn was doing such a great job. You're saying, I got six, 700 shares. What's that mean to me? You multiply that and some splits and 1,600 to 8,000 to 17,000, you're talking about a great deal of money while you're still doing what else? While you're still growing, while you're still making yourself proud for your family, while you're still saying, what's next? What else? How can I help? What a great opportunity to do what you do, ask what else, be in a company that's growing at the same time with a bunch of people who really care about what happens to you. That's what that's all about. Don't look at it now. Don't look at it where you are now, but look at the future of what else. Think about where you want to be in 10, 15, 20, 30 years. I've lived it, I can see it, I can smell it, I can tell you that. He talked about splits when we were a traveler's group. That's real, that's real stuff. It builds, only way to build wealth in this country is generational passing of wealth from one family to the next. You got that opportunity. That country, this country gives you that opportunity. That's the secret sauce. The secret sauce is I got the opportunity, I do well, I pass it on. That's the secret sauce. You have the secret sauce embodied in this company. Only way you could build wealth is inherit it, which I didn't. I can build my own business, I didn't. But I was part of other, a big business that wanted to do the same thing for me, so that's how I did it. You got that opportunity to be able to do that. I can't tell you how proud I am that I have had the opportunity to be in business with all of you the last few years or so. It has been a wonderful what else. It has been a wonderful opportunity to meet new people and guide the stories I could be here all day, but you gave me the ability to be able to fulfill my own what else. So I want to finish with this video. You saw the beginning of the Notre Dame speech. This was on the 50 yard line before the Southern Cal game and it was one of the great highlights of my life to be able to do something I never knew would happen other than the fact I put myself in a position for a what else. Josh? Doing all right. Yeah. Yeah. Looking this good out here. I just want to make sure I came back when it was a little cooler. It was a little hot last time I was here. I want to make sure that you remember what we talked about when I was here in August. Okay? I want you to make sure that we remember what you committed to. You committed to a vision to win a national championship. You're still good with that? Yes, sir. You committed to be able to burn the boats. You committed to burn the boats no matter what happened, no matter what the adversity was. You committed to that. Did I get that right? You still there? Yes, sir. You also had a purpose. The purpose was to take care of each other to make sure that you held each other accountable to make sure you burned the boats, to make sure you had the vision to win a national championship. You still good with that? Yes, sir. You also told me you had heart. You told me you had passion. Remember we talked about passion comes from the heart. It comes from the accumulation of the vision, the purpose, and the commitment. You got passion, you're ready for tonight's passion. Yes, sir. I'm asking you guys, if you take a question mark 
and you straighten the question mark out, what do you have? You got an exclamation point. Tonight is an exclamation point for the rest of the season. You're going to show the world tonight that all that stuff you saw on television with burner boats and vision is a real exclamation point. And the real Notre Dame football team shows up tonight, impresses in all three phases of the game. Exclamation point. You got six games to go. Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point, and what else? Thank you, everybody. Thank you.